Hi there and welcome. You are listening to The Hoof of the Horse, a podcast dedicated to farriery and equine science with Dr. Simon Curtis. In this episode, I will be answering some questions about my new book, The Hoof of the Horse, which comes out this month. If you would like to pre-order a copy, you can do that now by going to curtisfarrierbooks.com. I will be signing the first 100 pre-orders, which I think we are quite close to now, so do order as soon as possible if you'd like your copy signed. Your new book, The Hoof of the Horse, is out very soon. What inspired you to write this and how did it all begin? Well, the inspiration is quite easy to explain. Um, I've examined young farriers for 20 years and I've been struck by the fact that they are taught at colleges everything there is to know about the tendons below the leg, the ligaments below the leg, uh, the blood supply, the nerve supply. You ask them a question on that and they really, especially at the top end, they're really quite good, they're very good. Um, But you ask those same young farriers, how does the hoof grow? And their mouth drops open, they look at you. Um, If you ask them, what are the material properties of hoof horn? Again, uh, they, they can't answer you. So it struck me that the thing that is most important to farriers is an understanding of the hoof. That's what we have in our hands every day. That's what we deal with. That's what we trim, that's what we shoe, um, that's what we glue to. So this has to be our primary knowledge. We have to know more about the hoof than anything else. That's what the life of a farrier is. That's our prime objective, is to look after this hoof to get the best out of it for um, the horse. And so, so that was what I wanted to address in this book. I wanted to write a book purely about the hoof, so that all the knowledge, not just my knowledge, but the knowledge of other people over um, the centuries, but especially over the last couple of decades, is put together to help explain how the hoof works, how it develops, um, how it reacts to things. So how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I suppose the facetious answer is uh, all my life. but the, the actuality of, the, of, of writing began January 2017. So it's been a two year project. Um, and of course, in January 2017, I'd come to the end of my PhD. So that was why really I'd got in the habit of writing. I could see that there was the possibility of a book within the PhD. So last year in January, I began planning it. And of course that requires you to uh, create the structure of the book. Now, nothing's written in stone until the book's actually published, but you do need a structure. So I, I listed what I thought were obvious chapters, and then it became apparent to me that it was a book of three sections. So I divided it into the three sections, and as I've said, my uh, or, or as I, I can see it, that the PhD is actually the middle section. Um, and then I, having... Uh, structured the book I started to do my research now I'd already done a lot of research for my PhD but there was research outside the realms of the PhD that I needed to do so I read what other people had written about the hoof Um, I was able to go into actual um, pure research um, the information that people had published in research papers in scientific papers so it wasn't just book reading it was reading other people's papers and so obviously lots of note taking and and deciding what was important to my book and what I didn't think was important Um, and then I started writing last summer I'd say or maybe last spring Um, and I had the main draft of the book written by December the 31st of uh, 2017 and so the rest of this year has actually been putting it together everybody I think when they think they've finished a book they're halfway through it Um, because you have to put illustrations in 
again, you have to check that your um, references are correct. Uh, you have to read through, you have to see that there's a flow to the book. So, so that all began January this year. And again, my target was to finish by the end of this year. And so we're slightly ahead of target in that the middle of November, it will be complete. And you mentioned the illustrations in the book. Where did you source those? There's some really beautiful imagery in there. Uh, most of them are my photographs. Um, I was very grateful to a few farriers and vets and scientists who supplied me with some. Uh, their names are under it, each picture that's been supplied. So, so if it doesn't have somebody else's name under the picture in the hoof of the horse, then it means I took that photograph myself. Um, as far as the actual artwork is concerned, or the illustrations which have been hand-drawn, um, they're all mine again. Um, I was a little bit wary about doing all my own. I'd, I have done diagrams before. Um, most of the diagrams in corrective farriery are my own, uh, but I'd had quite a gap and I no longer do any art, so I was a bit worried about my, my art skills. But in the end, I, I, I don't know, bit the bullet and I've done them myself. Uh, many of the diagrams are from my PhD, so I'd already done those for my thesis, um, and so they're just transferred in. But the actual uh, fine artwork is, is new, and a lot of the photographs are new. Very few of the photographs um, for illustrations come out of my previous books. Every now and again, I couldn't get a better one. So, of course, um, I borrowed from Corrective Barriery and even Fold to Racehorse. But again, it's made quite clear in the book um, where I've done that. So you mentioned in there that the middle section of your book will be largely based around your PhD research. Uh, what was the most difficult part of writing your thesis and doing the work for your PhD? OK, uh, all of it is a simple answer to that. No, that, that's not true. Um, what was the most difficult part? Let me see. Uh, I think statistics I struggled with. Um, I'm not a very mathematical person. Everybody that's good at statistics says, oh, it's not mathematics. Yes, it is. It's another branch of mathematics. Um, but I, that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. I think sometimes my university thought I didn't enjoy it. I actually think that if you, if you do your statistics correctly, then it's another way to illustrate your work or illuminate your work. In other words, it, it, all of us, we, we all think that we don't understand statistics. But if I said to you that 75% of the time I spend trimming horses, you would know exactly what I meant. That's a simple statistic, a percentage. So, so we all use statistics all the time. Um, but, it, but it's how we use them and, and how relevant they are. Now, of course, statistics in a scientific work are more than just illustrating. They are testing. And you have to test your data collection um, thoroughly with statistics. And there's a whole ream of statistics. But I had a lot of help um, from my university in doing that. And, and as I say, in the end, I enjoyed that. Um, I think one of the things I found difficult was actually not doing too many studies. I was like a little boy in a sweet shop. I wanted to study everything. Um, and you can't do that. What you're supposed to do, especially at PhD, is you're supposed to drill deep and narrow so that you find um, so that you find new uh, knowledge um, but it's at depth but you know order to do it at depth you can't study everything so I was quite specific on what I studied um, as I say I would still like to study more and of course people that have listened to me speak about my PhD there, there's often a reaction especially from farriers to say well why didn't you study this and I think about the meeting I had with the big professor, so my professor's boss, and he actually said quite firmly, like a schoolmaster, no more studies. Just get the, get the uh, in other words, um, look in depth at what you've already got. So I found that hard to keep that under control. Uh, the writing I didn't find so difficult. Uh, scientific writing is different than writing for articles. Um, it's very dry. Uh, there's certain conventions that you have to stick to. But I think once you get the hang of that, 
then then that's okay as well. Um, I think that's about it, really. I suppose the the hardest thing I found was driving between four and six hours to my university once a month uh, up there and then back. That can actually get you in the end <laughs> over a period of nearly six years. Can you just tell us some of the topics from your thesis that have ended up in the book? Um, any areas that you'll be looking at in particular? OK, um, I think, as I said, the middle section, section two, is... Um, based on that and I have a sort of subheading for that section I call it the story of the hoof because it takes the hoof from within the uterus um, so knowledge about that now we don't have to trim we can't trim hooves before the the foal is born but it's it is really interesting the way the hoof develops Um, and I looked at some of those in my PhD because I, I collected cadaver specimens which is quite a sad thing to do but obviously with the volume of foals there are in Newmarket, there are always deaths. It's actually quite surprising, the low mortality rate. So I had a job um, uh, collecting um, enough cadavers. By and large, like most animals, if an animal lives beyond the first few days of birth, after birth, they tend to live forever, or until their <laughs> normal... I should not forever, but for their normal lifespan... Um, so actually, I could collect quite a few that sadly um, died just before birth or died on the day of birth. Um, but after that, there there are very few. So I had a job collecting those. So the first chapter in the book is about the fetal and embryonic development of the hoof. And then the second chapter is the main part of my thesis, which was um, the paediatric foal. And there's always a debate about when is a foal paediatric or not. Some people have said to me, well, they're paediatric the whole time, they're foals. But there are other definitions that they are a paediatric foal until they're weaned, until they leave their mother. And for most foals, that's about four, five, maybe six months of age. So that that formed chapter two. And that's really the most dynamic and interesting part of hoof development. The hoof is constantly changing shape. Of course, it's expanding in size. But you know it's not expanding in size rapidly enough to keep up the development of the foal. A thoroughbred foal, and of course this will go for all all breeds of, of horse, but a thoroughbred foal on average is 53 kilos at birth. At one month old it's 100 kilos, at two months old it's 150 kilos. So it tre- trebles its weight in two months. Its hooves do not treble in size, they can't. In fact it's still mainly walking on the hoof that it was born with. So that causes issues in itself um, to the hoof. And part of what I looked at is how the horse copes with that, or should I say how the hoof copes with that. It's a great question of why do hooves grow so quickly in young foals. But I think the partial answer is that the, the foal obviously has a very thin hoof when it's born, and yet it has to travel behind its mother and has to walk as far as its mother and the herd so it's getting as much wear to its hoof. Uh, in two months, it's 150 kilos. Its mother is only weighing 450 kilos. And yet it's got this very thin hoof. So it, I think it overcomes that by rapid hoof growth. There is another reason, I think, why hoof growth is so rapid. But I will leave that for people when they buy the book and, and read The Hoof of the Horse to discover why. I think there's probably a more important reason than just due to countering wear. Then I moved on, the third chapter is the phase from when the foal is weaned until it enters work. Now, of course, horses, they don't all enter work at the same time. For many horses, that's four or five years of age. For the thoroughbred, it's two years of age. So at what point do you say a horse reaches maturity? Well, my definition was just when it starts full exercise and full work. So the period before that of weanling and yearling is still a very rapid growing time, not quite as rapid as the paediatric foal, and that has an impact on the hoof. And of course it's during this period that we see the development of the club foot. So, um, or we see the club foot appear, and we see see other issues with the hoof appear. Um, It's an interesting thing that the foal is born with four pristine hooves perfectly formed, ready to go, because it has to follow its mother and herd. And we know that very, very few mature horses have a perfect pair of front hooves, shall we say, 
hind hooves tend to be more paired, but the front hooves differ quite a bit, and they differ in symmetry from uh, if you if you have an imaginary line through the frog, uh, the left side of the foot and the right side of the foot differ in maturity, and that's quite normal, healthy, and typical, whichever one of those words you want to use. So the question is. A, why are they born with some symmetrical hooves? And why do those hooves alter in their symmetry? Why do they alter uh, unhealthily? And why do they alter healthily? They do both of those things. So that was a big question in my PhD and I've transferred that into the book. There are some answers. I'd have to say at this point, anybody that thinks all the answers are in this book um, is, is naive. Uh, there, are, there is lots of new knowledge no end of new facts, new findings, not just my own, but what I've gleaned from other people. But is every answer to every question in there? Probably not. In fact, if I learnt nothing else from science, is that every answer that you gain, uh, you can think of two more questions about that answer. So where have we got to? We've got to the mature horse. And of course, the mature horse is why we've horse has been bred. It's its whole reason for being. It's why it's spread across the world, because we use it in a hundred different ways. Um, we tend to think of sports, but there are still horses that are used as beasts of burden. There's still horses that are pull, pulling carriages. But even the sports use of horses varies so much from an endurance to a trekking horse, to polo, to racing, uh, to show jumping. All those have an impact upon the hoof and, and therefore we need an understanding of why exercise is affecting the hoof. And it's at this point that we start to get more problems with the hoof. We get more infections of the hoof. We get more stress-related injuries. We get more actual injuries. You know, a horse can hit its foot on something or its coronary band. That affects the way the hoof grows. Those things are, are not excluded from young horses, but they don't happen very often with a horse in a nice, safe paddock. So we get through the mature horse, and of course that's quite a large chapter because most of us especially as farriers are working on uh, mature horses in the middle of their um, working life. And of course, finally, the horse goes into old age. Now, again, there's a question of when old age happens. Does it happen when the horse just stops its main work? In which case, of course, the racehorse, which often retires at four or five years old, would say it's an old horse. Well, that's nonsensical. So the insurance agent insurers of horses uh, used to have a cut-off date at 15 years and I think that's actually probably quite a good cut-off date for when the horse enters old age it doesn't mean people stop riding it of course there's 20 year old horses that are ridden but it's quite a good uh, cut-off date so I tended to look at what happens to the horse's hoof at 15 years plus and of course some horses live to 30 years um, do they have anything that goes wrong with their hooves because of old age? Probably not. There's, there's not any disease or issue which is just exclusive to old age. But of course, there's an accumulation of injuries and diseases through the horse's life. Some of them never disappear. And, and so some old horses have a number of issues. There's another thing, of course, is that the, this hoof growth rate continues to decline into old age. So now there's a problem with our aged horse that if it has an injury to its hoof, it takes longer to grow out than a young horse. So it's with it for a longer time. I have a slight theory about uh, why horses grow their hooves a lot slower when they're old. And that almost takes us back to this newborn foal, why it grows so fast. If you are, um, you live a more sedentary life when you're old and, and horses do the same. So if they're not moving about so much, they're not wearing their hooves so much, so actually growing too much hoof would cause them another problem. So that's a bit of a theory, I can't prove that, um, but it's a different way of thinking about the hoof and why it has this continually changing um, hoof growth rate. So that's really the middle section, it's quite a big section, and I tend to think of it as the five ages of the hoof. Um, and I don't think anybody's thought about it that way before, but I think it's a nice way of dividing up this hoof into ages and thinking about the issues that occur uh, at these different stages in the horse's life. So obviously there's quite a lot of scientific information in the book. Who do you think this book is going to be helpful to? 
Well, I've always primarily written for farriers. I am a farrier, so that's who I target. But I would say that 30 or 40% of my books sell to vets. I hope vets are still interested in this. It's not a treatment book, whereas my other three, my previous three books, Hold a Racehorse and the two um, two volumes of Cracked Farriery, were treatment books. In other words, you would look up in them if your horse had a problem, uh, how might you uh, treat it as a farrier or as a vet with um, an interest in the foot. Of course, there were other people who always bought my books, um, interested horse owners, and certainly um, hoof trimmers, you know, people who do not shoe horses but just trim. And and so I hope this is still an interest to all those other groups. But when you write a book, you have to have a target audience. You have to have a vision of where your book is going, what you hope to fulfil and who your audience is. Now... You've asked me about it, it's a book, a scientific book, and it is. But people shouldn't be put off by that because all of us are interested in science, I think. Um, We only have to think about certain shows on television that we just relax and watch, and whether it's uh, the Blue Planet or whether whether we have an interest in science in, in, in something else, how did they get a rocket to the moon. I think inside all of us there is an interest in science, Um, So it was my job to write a scientific book that's readable and that would be for other people to judge whether I've achieved that. But that was my aim as well. It's not a book for scientists, that's for sure. It is a science book. At the start of my university life, uh, one of my supervisors said that I was a farrier with an interest in science and that she was going to turn me into a scientist who was also a farrier. And I asked her at the end and she says, yes, that's what I've become. So I think inside all of us there is an interest in science and people who buy this book are going to have an interest in science but an interest in the hoof. Um, So it, it is not full of statistics, that is for sure. It has a number of graphs which are taken from those statistics and again, all of us like graphs, don't we? We, we, can, we can understand simple graphs. We can understand if a graph is going up or down or there's a concentration in one area. And there's a number of graphs that show that. So, yes, there's five or six graphs in the book. And I hope they help bring the words to life and make it clearer what I'm trying to say within the book. So you said your supervisor did succeed in turning you into a scientist. What advice would you give to other farriers looking to get more involved in the science side of their work? Okay, the first thing I should say is is the name of that mysterious supervisor is uh, Dr. Sarah Hobbs. And actually, strictly speaking, she was my director of studies, so she was my boss. So your question is, how can farriers who are interested in science get into it? Well, there's um, a number of ways now uh, which is, is wonderful. For most farriers, for most um, people wanting to get do a master's or a PhD, you need to have a Bachelor of Science to start with. And you can have any Bachelor of Science. This is not a farrier Bachelor of Science, and that gets you in. Uh, but I actually did the science degree, the farrier science degree, which is still run by Myasco um, through the University of Central Lancashire up near Preston. And that's a great way of getting into science. Uh, The Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons is also doing a a diploma in science. I've I've probably got, or in farriery science, I've probably got the title of that wrong. But they are certainly doing um, a course which a lot of farriers have joined, have signed up to. And that's a two-year course. And they come out of that uh, with a lot of scientific knowledge. They learn how to read science, how to write science, how to do a study and how to do statistics. And of course, there is still the traditional, which I happen to think is the best way, uh, which is to do a fellowship. Uh, We have two or 300 farriers in this country who are associates. I think all of them should consider doing the fellowship examination. And one half of that fellowship examination is uh, to conduct a study um, and to write it up as a fellowship thesis of three to 5,000 words, which sounds a lot to farriers, and every farrier I've known that's attempted the fellowship 
then has a problem of how to cut it down to under 5,000 words. So it seems a lot at the start. When you, when you start getting into things in detail and do a properly uh, conducted study and then write it up, that's not a lot. Of course, a number of people have used these two previous um, the, uh, courses that I've mentioned to help them towards the fellowship thesis, and I think that's a very, very good way of doing that. Also, they need to learn how to present. So, and, and, and I had to do that for my PhD. It was probably the easiest thing for me because I've given lectures for 30 years. But universities expect you to present your work. It is part of the skills. It's no good learning this stuff and hiding it away. The whole point is that you try and disperse this knowledge as widely um, as possible. So that's three ways that farriers can become more scientific. In America, there is a sister course to the one at the Royal Veterinary College. People will have to do a little bit more research where it's conducted because at, off the top of my head, I can't tell them where, but it is based on the course in London and farriers are able to do that. And I think there, obviously, if any farrier just wants to go back to university and do a part-time degree course, lots of universities do that. They encourage you to do that nowadays. It's... Um, it's a wonderful part of continuing education for all of us that, that these, these universities want you to continue studying. So you have to do a little bit of uh, looking into that yourself, see what suits you, and then you can go down that road. OK, well, that brings me to my last question now. What can we expect next from you? Maybe you can tell us about any projects you have in the works, any new books... Yes. Yeah, more books. Let me get this one out of the way, first of all, please. Um, so, I mean, the initial part of this, of getting this book out, which comes out um, in mid-November, uh, I already have a number of presentations which are based on that. I'm going up to Scotland uh, to do a vet conference, vet farrier conference, I should say, at the University of Glasgow. Um, I'm off to Spain later in November, although I'm not, I don't, I'm not really presenting my, my book there. But then in the new year, I've got lots of invites where I'm presenting parts of my book. I'm at the International Hoof Care Summit in America, which of course is the biggest farrier conference in the world. And uh, my new book will be on sale there and through Ali Hayes at Horse Science and another number of other dealers. And I'm presenting uh, lectures on that. Um, then I'm off to Denmark, Sweden, <laughs> Finland, and Australia twice um, next year. So those are bookings that I know I've got, um, and they're all to do with, with this new book. Uh, however, in the new year, I do start work on another book. Um, I'm not going to tell you the title of it, and I'm not going to tell you who I'm working on with it, because we're too far away. But we would hope that that will come out in the middle of 2020. So probably... 20 months away something like that that's the target i'm not saying we'll be on time but that's our target and that's a whole new book which is not related to this one uh, and nor my previous three books and and so people can just guess at what it's about um all these things overlap of course but i think it's important not to should we say just revisit your previous work um it is to come up with original um, new ideas. I think that's what the farriery world work wants. It's what the veterinary world wants, and I think it's what the horse world wants. So I think there's room for new books, and that's what I'm going to be working hard on. So that's continuing my career. Uh, I have cut down on shoeing. I'm now only shoeing and trimming two days a week, and that of course allows me to uh, explore all these other avenues. You can follow more of Simon's work on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. To get in contact, email thehoofofthehorse at gmail.com or if you're interested in Simon's books, please go to curtisfarrierbooks.com. Thanks for listening.